Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, thank you and welcome to Harbon Islamic Study Circle HISC, Sira session 177. So uh, last week, what uh, we covered was uh, the second day following the conquest of Makkah uh, and some of the other converts that uh, uh, gave their pledge and converted. So <clears throat> we talked about how the Prophet Sallam in total stayed for about 19 days following the conquest of Makkah in Makkah. Uh, he couldn't live in his old house. He couldn't live in Abu Talib's house, the house where he grew up, because they'd been sold off. Uh, so he set up a tent in a nearby uh, valley. Uh, and uh, one of the um, Sahabi brought his brother along to the Prophet and said, can you give him the glad tidings of Hijra? And the Prophet uh, famously said, there is no Hijra after the conquest, after the Fatah Makkah. So the the religious reward associated with the Hijra to Medina that had now been abolished. Uh, now you can get the, re the reward for your intention uh, of migration, but it's not the same as back then because it was Fardu Ain on the Muslims to uh, migrate to uh, Medina if they could. So that, that, that rule had been abolished. Prophet then went on to Mount Safa, the place where he started his public dawah. And then he was asking the, the, the ladies of Makkah to embrace Islam and give bayah. As he's going through the rules and regulations and the requirements, uh, one of the women in full veil, Hint Binti uh, Utbah, uh, the wife of Abu Sufyan, she starts speaking out and or on every condition, not necessarily objecting, but having to say something. And those conditions are, like said, you have to accept Allah, do not steal, do not commit adultery, don't kill your children. And then uh, on, a, uh, on a couple of those things, when she's objecting, A, for when she's stealing from her husband, Abu Sufyan, uh, who she says is miserly, Prophet Sallam laughed. Uh, and then when she said that uh, we, we didn't kill our children, we gave birth to them and brought them up, and then you killed them on the Battle of Badr. And then Umar bin al-Khattab, he, uh, he laughed out and literally fell on his back laughing. Uh, meanwhile, the Ansar were seeing how the Prophet is in, in Makkah. You know, he, you know, he's sort of, uh, he's a different person now in, in, in Makkah. He's uh, walking around, strutting around. Well, not strutting around, but, you know, has, has a different, uh, you know, spring in his step. And, and so they're getting a bit anxious. What, what's the Prophet uh, going to do? Rumors start to spread uh, that, you know, he's getting soft on his people. Uh, and then Prophet ﷺ, he calls them and he sits them down and then he reassures them that he's still one of them. He gave them a pledge to be with them through thick and thin, essentially. And that's what he's going to fulfill. He's now one of them. He, uh, the Ansar are reassured and then he forgives them. So, inshallah, today we'll talk about some more of the prominent conversions uh, and some of those stories uh, and before, inshallah, maybe uh, starting on some of the the expeditions that uh, the Prophet then dispatched uh, during these 19 days. So we've already talked about how just prior to the uh, conquest of Abu Sufyan and Itab bin Usaid and Al-Harith bin Hisham, uh, Abu Jal's brother, they converted. Uh, then we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago about Abu Qahafa, Abu Bakr's father. We've also talked about Hint uh, bin uh, Utbah. Uh, today we're going to talk about three or four other uh, prominent uh, people that the historians uh, record. Um, first of these we'll talk about is Safwan uh, bin Umayyah. Now, uh, Safwan bin Umayyah, uh, he is, if you can remember, the son of Umayyah bin Khalaf. So, Safwan bin Umayyah bin Khalaf. Now, Umayyah bin Khalaf was the owner of Bilal. And uh, so, uh, you know, these are the elites of the uh, of the Quraysh. And we talked about how uh, Umayyah bin Khalaf, how much hatred he had towards Islam and the Prophet ﷺ, um, and uh, how he treated Bilal. Um, but uh, so Safwan is the son of, so the generation below uh, Umayyah. But because the elder generation of principally all being killed off during Badr uh, and subsequently apart from uh, Suhail bin Amr and Abu Sufyan um, 
uh, they sort of take on the mantle like Ikrama ibn Abi Jahl, he takes on the mantle from his father Abu Jahl. So uh, Safan, he was uh, one of those who tried to fight back and we talked about how there was a small group with Ikrama and Safwan who tried to you know, uh, resist the army coming in and Khalid bin Walid dealt with them sternly and swiftly. So then he fled, obviously, uh, because of that. Um, and then uh, as he's fleeing, he, you know, he tells his family, I can't live here anymore in Makkah. Obviously, he probably thinks there's a price on his head. And he says, I can't live in here. Uh, I'm just going to go and throw myself in the sea. I'm just going to drown. I'm just going to disappear. And so you guys take care of yourself. It's I'm too humiliated in myself to live in Makkah under uh, the Prophet So, uh, so he promptly flees from uh, Makkah and goes towards Jeddah. Wants to catch a boat, you know. And as far as he's concerned, he just wants to get away. And if he drowns in the process, so be it. Whether whether his he had a firm intention of committing suicide, Allah knows best. But anyway, he he goes there. Then his cousin and best friend called Umair uh, ibn Wahhab, he seeks out, well, where's Safwan? Where's Safwan? And uh, Safwan and Umair uh, were very close. Uh, and uh, you might be able to remember the story of uh, Safwan uh, and Umair. So this was, uh, this was after the Battle of Badr, huge humiliation for the people of uh, Makkah and then uh, Umair he starts you know uh, boastfully you know saying wallahi I would go kill the prophet myself I'd personally go and kill him and assassinate him but alas I can't because I've got a family I've got daughters to look after um, then Safwan when he hears that as his as his best friend and cousin says look don't worry I'm you know the the, the son of the chief you know, I'm, I'm the son of, uh, of Umair. So don't worry about your daughters. From now on, your daughters are like my daughters. I will give them everything. You just go take care of uh, Muhammad. So basically called his bluff. So then Umair says, okay, fine. And, 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 and they plot a, um, a scheme, if you remember, that uh, Umair would go to the Prophet in Medina, pretend to become a Muslim, but he would take a, a dagger dipped in poison uh, and then he would, you know, uh, stab the Prophet with that dagger dipped in poison and the Prophet would die because of that. So that was the plan. So he he gets to Medina, Umair, uh, and then he goes, meets the Prophet uh, probably in the masjid, but he goes, meets the, the Prophet and the Prophet says, because uh, obviously when, when you're going to meet the Prophet uh, especially after the war, and there's an existential threat, and we've talked about this before, you can't just go in with all your um, all your swords and everything. Uh, so you, you know, outside a tent or wherever, you'd have to hand over your sword. So he's got this sort of little dagger, ceremonial dagger around him. And the Prophet turns to uh, Umair and says, why have you got that dagger around your neck? And then he tries to laugh it off. Oh, what use are our swords? What use were our swords at Badr anyway? Um, and this is just uh, hanging there. It's just like a ceremonial sword. Don't need to worry about that. And then the Prophet sort of looked him in the eye and said, "No, you're lying. Rather, you and Safwan, you sat in the shade of the Kaaba and you said that you would kill me. And then he replied, that he's going to take care of your children. And so, sort of verbatim, word for word, he recounts that conversation between Safwan and uh, Umayyad." And then uh, Umar says, well, how, you know, no one could have told you that because that was a secret meeting. We weren't overheard. And obviously, Safwan's not going to tell you. And he goes, how do you know? And then he goes, oh, Allah told me. So there and then, Umar accepted Islam uh, and became a strong believer. Uh, in the meantime, Safwan, back in Makkah, he's strutting around telling people, you just wait and see. You just wait and see. Umair is going to come back with some really good news. He's gonna, he's he's gonna, he's uh, he's gonna come back and he's gonna blow your mind. So he's not telling people the plot, but he's just saying, just wait, just wait till he comes out. Wait till he comes back. Wait till he hear the good news. And then Umair comes back as a secret Muslim, 
uh, and then go, goes, uh, meets Safwan, and then Safwan says, you know, what happened? And then Umair just says, you know, I, I, I've become a Muslim. And, you know, Safwan, having hyped up Umair, is just nowhere to be seen. So you can see there's some bad blood between them now. So, so uh, Umair is part of the army, obviously, go, you know, during the conquest, uh, and he sort of uh, purposely seeks out Safwan. Uh, and, uh, you know, he knows him, he's grown up with him, he, he knows there is some good in him. Uh, so uh, he finds out that Safwan has fled, so, uh, you know, uh, pledging to kill himself. Uh, so, um, so Umair panics, goes to the Prophet and says, you know, um, uh, will you give Safwan protection? And the Prophet says, okay, fine, you know. So Umair says, okay, fine. Uh, can you give me some token so I can show him that he will believe me? I know the way he thinks. He's not just going to accept my word for it. I need to show him something that demonstrates you've given him your protection. And the Prophet says, so fine, takes his turban off, hands his own turban to Umair, uh, the, the same turban that he wore as he's entering in conquering Makkah. Uh, and obviously, everyone's seen that, and 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 in those days, people recognise other people's turbans. They're very distinctive, um, and so um, uh, Umair takes that and and chases after Safan, and you know, like one of those Hollywood you know movies, probably just as about Safan to to get onto the boat to 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 to, to leave the peninsula. You know, uh, Umair is saying, stop, 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 stop. And then he catches up with him. And, and, and then they sort of uh, starting, uh, start having banter because they, they left on bad terms. So uh, Safwan thinks Umair is there to kill him uh, because why else would he be there? Uh, and then he starts shouting, you've come to kill me. You're a traitor. You know, uh, don't come near me. And then... Umair is trying to calm down. I said, no, 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 I'm not here to kill you. I've come from the best of human beings. And more, you know, what's more than that, he has given you his protection. And, and Safan thinks, no, this is just a ploy. You're a liar. You're a cheater. You're a traitor. Uh, and, and then Umair persists and says, look, here, I have got uh, his, um, his, his, his turban. You know, you know, come back, Safan, because, you know, you need to come back to the best of people. Know that he, as in the Prophet ﷺ, uh, in Qurayshi terms, he is your cousin. He is the most merciful. He is the most kind. His honor is your honor. His kingdom is your kingdom. And here's his turban. And he sent you, uh, sent it to you, promising you protection. So here what, what Umair is doing, Umair is using the language that Safwan, as a nobleman, as a proud, arrogant uh, son of a chief, would understand. It, it, it's not necessarily the the approach to Dawa we would use, but he's just he's just framing the conversation in a language that uh, Safwan will understand. So he needs to sort of break it down uh, and reach out to him. And the way he reaches out to him is say, basically, look, he's your cousin. He's your kith and kin. You know, he's merciful. You know, his honor is your honor. He's a Qureshi, you're a Qureshi, right? His kingdom is your kingdom. Well, you know, what have you got to lose? So he's invoking the, this sense of tribalism, the, the, this really base bond, because he knows that Safwan's going to get uh, attracted to that, uh, you know, appealing to his ears. So when Safwan saw the turban, he thought, well, okay, yeah, this could be the real deal. Uh, so then he reluctantly but cautiously comes back with uh, Umair. And then they reach to Makkah as the Prophet Sallam is finishing uh, Salat al-Asr, obviously, uh, by the Kaaba. So Safan turns to Umair, because this, this is in, you know, in the sort of early to late afternoon. So he, Safan turns to Umair and says, my gosh, how many times do you guys pray? And then Umair goes, we pray five times a day. And he goes, five times a day? Whoa, how can you pray five times a day? And he's just like, you know, then he goes, you pray five times? And he leads you in prayer five times a day? 
And uh, and he goes, yeah. And again, for the non-Muslim or the new Muslim, these things are mind blowing for us. We just take it for granted. We pray five times a day, and 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 and, and sort of the 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 the, the sort of uh, stronger of us, we we um, rearrange our day around our prayers, you know. And and uh, so so you know, for 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 a new Muslim, this is a completely alien concept. Uh, and again, if you come across new Muslims, you're probably you know they, they have the same gut reaction. They you know if if they're from a Christian background, well, they just go to church on a Sunday. And they do mass or whatever, but to actually pray five times a day, it's it's mind blowing for some people. But here 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 is uh, Safwan on his horse, um, ready to make a quick exit should things go turn nasty. So uh, when when the process is finished, uh, he he doesn't get down and he shouts out because this is a public forum. He's in front of the Kaaba and the process is He's with all the people, so he wants. He wants a public acknowledgement from the Prophet. So then he shouts out, Ya Muhammad, obviously he's not a believer yet. He goes, Ya Muhammad, Umair has come to me saying that you have promised me protection. So you can see how he's framing it uh, in, in a very sort of legalistic uh, uh, way. So he's, he's reporting the chain of narration and what's being said, and he's seeking confirmation. Oh, Muhammad, Umair has said, uh, he's come to me saying, you've promised me protection. Is that true? And this is in, in front of everyone. So the Prophet says, yeah, come down. And he goes, no, 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 I'm not going to come down until you promise me and tell me that I have at least two months of protection. So I can't be touched for two months. So the Prophet says, fine, I'll give you four months protection. <laughs> so, so then he came down and they started uh, chatting, but he didn't accept Islam there and then because his his hatred was was quite firm. Um, and um, it wasn't until much, so he, he'd given him four months protection to put his mind at ease because this is a public acknowledgement. Um, he didn't become Muslim straight. He became Muslim uh, slightly later, and, and this is when uh, we'll do this inshallah in, in a few weeks uh, after uh, uh, the siege of Taif. Uh, the Prophet had asked um, Safwan because he's got, you know, he's you know uh, he's got a lot of armor. He's got a lot of weapons and, and uh, stuff from his father inherited. Uh, you know, a lot, at least a hundred, uh, you know, uh, chains of uh, coats of armor, chainmail. And the Prophet um, you know, needs, needed some extra. So he, he went to Safwan uh, and uh, said, um, can you lend me at least 100 coats of armor? And uh, Safwan says, are you asking me or are you forcibly taking that? Because the Prophet could take it because he's chief, right? He, he's conquered them and he could easily just say, hand it over, but he's asking. And so Safwan wants to know, well, are you just asking me for it? Or are you forcing uh, me to give it to you? No, no, process. No, this is a guaranteed loan. Okay, you give it to me, and I will return all a hundred. If not, I will recompense you for any loss. And then, um, and he says, "Yeah, okay, that's fine." And he gave it to him. He went along, participated in the Battle of Hunain, not on the side of the Muslims per se, but just as sort of like an independent little group uh, uh, um, uh, alongside. Uh, and there was just a small group of these people, um, and uh, they didn't play any significant role in 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 Hunain. But he was there, possibly just to see what's what's going to happen, especially with his armor, because he's got, as we say, skin in the game. So after the Battle of Hunain, the Prophet Salam, um, he uh, 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 took a lot of uh, Hanima war booty, and this was a, a huge amount of war booty, and. Um, uh, and um, Safwan is standing there at the top of the valley looking at all of they've captured and there's a huge herds of you know uh, sheep and goats in, in a complete uh, uh, in a valley so uh, and, and it's reported by the historians that the, the, the booty following Hunain was far in excess of what the Muslims uh earned or captured uh, following Khaybar, which up until then was 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 the biggest uh, um, quantitative uh, monetary victory for them. 
Uh, so he's, you know, he's seeing this, you know, valley full of, uh, you know, sheep and, and, and fortune and, and being Safan, being the son of a noble being, sort of, you know, uh, thinking in those capitalists, almost sort of uh, quantitative terms, he, his eyes are popping out. And the Protestant sees his eyes popping out. And the Protestant says, are you amazed by all of this? And Safan goes, yeah, of course I am. Look at all this, what you've captured. And the Protestant turns to him and says, look, it's all yours. And Safan's a non-Muslim at this point. And the Protestant is just like, it's yours. You can just take it. And he goes, oh, the entire valley? He goes, yeah, it's all yours. And then there and then he goes, look, such a gift can only come from the heart of a prophet. So, I mean, you could you could consider it a, a bribe, but it did the trick, right? Uh, you know, uh, Safan was just so amazed that somebody could, knowing him, you know, knowing the way he thinks, give him so much wealth without blinking an eye. He goes, like, only... A prophet would uh, do this. And then Safan later on, he says, look, the prophet was so generous, he gave and he continued to give until I became, until he became the most beloved person to me. So again, this is, this is the way the process works, that, you know, people who have this visceral hatred to the process, the process becomes very open and generous with them, so much so that that, visceral hatred flips that they become the from from inside the very being of your existence you love them more than anything and this is what Safan is saying uh, and you know uh, however he got into Islam he became a strong Muslim you know uh, you know uh, uh, just like you know Ikrama ibn Abijal who fought against Prophet became a strong Muslim you know and uh, and uh, uh, he became a strong, you know, abd, a worshipper, and it said that him, like Ikrama, uh, died a uh, shaheed. So that's the story of Safwan uh, ibn Umayyah. The next big chief, or the, the the other really senior person who's left is, and we know we've talked about his story before, or his, his person before, and that is Suhail uh, ibn Amr. Now, you may remember Suhail, uh, but... Uh, he is, as I say, of the generation of Umayyad bin Khalaf, uh, Abu Sufyan, uh, uh, Abu Jal. He's of that generation. He was, he was chosen as the senior most uh, negotiator, delegate to negotiate with the process at Hudaybiyah. And if you remember, uh, Sahel was the one who put the really strict conditions, right? About you know, if somebody leaves. Uh, Makkah comes to Medina, we keep him. If someone leaves Makkah, goes to Medina, you have to send him back. So he was the the, the, the chief negotiator. He was given uh, complete uh, autonomy to make uh, to uh, uh, come to a, a conclusion, uh, an agreement with the Prophet And the red line was they are not to do, uh, not to enter Makkah that year. So he was given sort of you know a, a free scope of how he negotiates. Um, and we talked about the story of his son, Abu Jandal, so who he kept in chains because his other son had become a Muslim. Uh, Abu Jandal, he escapes his chains from the dungeon of his house of his father, Sahel, reaches to the camp of the Muslims. And the Prophet is physically negotiating that exact term of returning the, the prisoners or, or the escapees. Uh, uh, then um, Sahel says, and the first person I want as part of this is my son Abu Jandal. And the Prophet he sort of said, no, but we haven't even signed the, the, uh, the agreement. We're just discussing it. We haven't even signed it. So allow me to have him. Because no, is this or no deal? You return him or everything is cancelled. And the Prophet is pleading with, Abu, uh, with Sahel, let him keep Abu Jandal. Because everyone knows the story of Abu Jandal, how he's been you know, whipped and tortured by his own father. Um, so, so this is Sahail ibn Amr. You know, he fought in Badr. He fought in Uhud, uh, in Khandaq, right? Um, so, uh, so he's got this legacy. He knows, although he's not on the 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 the, the hit list. He's not on the the death death list uh, when the process was entered because there there was a, a blacklist of people who were exempt from uh, the amnesty. He's not on that list. 
you know, so, you know, he would come under the general amnesty, but he himself thinks I've done so much harm to the Prophet he's out to get me. So he's terrified when uh, the Prophet uh, conquers, he locks himself in his house. Uh, most of his, you know, uh, children and sons have, have become Muslim. So he turns to his eldest son. He, there's no way out for him. Right? And everyone recognizes him. He, he's lost the opportunity like uh, Iknama and uh, Safwan to escape. And, and the whole place is in lockdown now. Um, uh, he doesn't know what to do. So he tells his eldest son, Abdullah, to go and beg for forgiveness from the Prophet Right? Uh, as I say, even though he's not on the list of those uh, that uh, uh, are, 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 are to be targeted. So, uh, so then, um, uh, so then uh, his, uh, his son Abdullah uh, uh, goes um, and, uh, uh, well, he, t he tells his, uh, his son Abdullah, look, I don't know anyone who is uh, still alive who has done more wrong than me. And again, he's, he's of the elite generation. I don't know anyone who is alive who's done more wrong than me, right? Because I was at Badr, then at Uhud, then at Khandak, and I showed Muhammad harshness at Hudaybiyah. Now, I don't know what he's going to do with me. So he's feeling regretful, remorseful, and fearing for his life, because that's how they think. Um, and uh, so Ab Abdullah goes to the Prophet and says, my father is asking for protection. So the Prophet says, yes, fine. He's protected by the protection of Allah. Uh, then his son obviously rejoiced, rushed back, told, told his father the good news. Then Sahel said, truly this man had been a good man, a righteous man, uh, a righteous young man, and now uh, as an adult. So basically saying, look, before he became a prophet, we knew him to be a good man, good, honorous man, uh, 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 good man of honor. You know, he was known as Al Amin, you know, the truthful, the trustworthy, right? So he said, surely, he, you know, I've known him all my life, right? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm older than him. Surely he's been righteous as a young boy and now as uh, an adult. Um, and so, so the Prophet son knows that Sahel's going to come uh, 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 and meet him. Uh, so the, the Prophet in the gathering with the Sahabi, he turns to the Sahabi and says, when Sahel comes, give him some respect. Don't stare at him in a mean way, because uh, he, he's a man of intelligence, honor, and he is too intelligent to be ignorant of Islam. So it's basically saying, look, I know you guys, because he's... What, because of what he's done, will have this sense of anger towards him uh, and this sense of, uh, of hatred towards him. And that's natural. But basically, he's of this you know, really respectful generation and he'll be good on our side. So don't even give him a mean glance. Don't, don't let him read your faces and see anger and, and, uh, and disappointment in him. Um, and... Uh, so, uh, so then, you know, that's exactly what happened. He went, uh, had a conversation with Prophet Sallam, and then accepted Islam. Um, and uh, not necessarily uh, there and then. I think he was also one of those who just waited to see uh, how things would pan out, just living under Islam for a while. And then I think after the Battle of Taif, he became a, a, a Muslim. Um, and again, he, he remained good. And there, we've talked before about a couple of stories where he's actually giving advice to Abu Sufyan about holding on to Islam. There was, there was a, a, an occasion, I think, much later on during the uh, Khilafah of Umar bin al-Khattab, they were all waiting outside the tent to go and see Umar. And uh, so Hale's waiting uh, alongside uh, Abu Sufyan. And then there are other people in front of them in the queue, uh, people like Bilal and uh, other people. And then the other people get sent in uh, to to greet and meet uh, Umar before him. And uh, they sort of turn, you know, uh, Abu Sufyan turns to uh, um, uh, Sahel and says, look, look at our situation. Look, basically, look, we are noble people. These people are going in front of us. And then Sahel sort of turned around and said, look, 
we caught the, the boat really late. These people, they entered Islam earlier. Their reward is so much greater than ours. You should be thankful for where you are now. And again, he's just reminding you know, Abu Sufyan that actually, look, you shouldn't have this hatred in your heart to these people who you think are below you because they got into Islam first. They, they sacrificed so much more than we did. Uh, so again, he's just like recalibrating the, the mindset of people like Abu Sufyan. So it shows that genuinely his conversion was genuine. He had a strong relationship with Allah, with the deen, with the Prophet Sallam. So he became a, a, a good, uh, strong Muslim. And again, just, just to, to mention that, uh, and I think we've talked about this before, there's no one who asked for forgiveness from the Prophet Sallam except that he was forgiven. And if you remember that, that, that includes the uh, Abdullah ibn uh, Sa'ad ibn Abu Sarh, who was on the hit list. And the Prophet uh, and, and then Abdullah came to the Prophet knowing he's on the hit list and begged for forgiveness and to become a Muslim. The Prophet remained silent, waiting for one of the Sahabi to chop his head off. Didn't happen. And then he forgave him and he became a Muslim and became a good Muslim after that. You know, even though he was on the hit list, uh, so you know there wasn't anyone who asked for forgiveness that wasn't forgiven. Like a couple of other people, uh, uh, again, in the scheme of things, here's somebody who wants to assassinate the Prophet Salam in Mecca after the conquest, and and, and he gets uh, forgiven. So this is someone called Fadala uh, Ibn Umair. So. Um, uh, uh, Fadala, he's a youngish lad, probably of the, the generation of Ikrimah. Uh, but again, you know, they've been brought up in, with a constant diet and propaganda against the Prophet, against Islam, against the Muslims. So he's been embedded with that visceral hatred towards all things Muslim. Um, and now he has to suffer the indignity and humiliation of living under Islam and he can't take it. So then he, uh, he decides to assassinate the Prophet, to kill the Prophet Sallam, which is again, it, it, it's pure folly. It, it's, it's a complete, I mean, we would call it like a suicide mission. I mean, here you've got the chief, the commander in chief, right? He's going to be well protected. If you do anything towards him, and, and the whole city is guarded by the Prophet uh, uh, elite guard, you do anything to the Prophet you know you're going to die. There's no way out. But his hatred is so much so, he's like, I'm going to kill the Prophet Sallam. When's the best time to kill him? Well, the best time where he is most vulnerable and unprotected is when he does tawaf. And the Prophet Sallam does tawaf regularly. So again, he, he takes a, 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 a dagger, uh, you know, uh, that one that he can conceal, and then he makes the intention uh, that he will kill the Prophet and the Prophet is doing tawaf. Because when the Prophet does tawaf, he has, you know, he has space around him. His, his elite guard will give him a bit of space uh, and, and let him do his, you know, uh, rituals, his worship uh, like that. And that's where the Prophet is most intense in, in, in worship and, and, and his focus is elsewhere. So he thinks that's the best time because he's been, he's been obviously watching and, and, and observing the habits of the Prophet the habits of his God, the habits of the Sahabi. And he, 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 he calculates that is the, uh, the strategic weak point where he can pounce. So the Prophet he, he's not there doing Umrah, he's just doing Tawaf. You know, so again, you know, uh, the, 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 the scholars have said, when you are in Mecca, just do as many tawaf as you can, because this is this is something that the Prophet uh, used to do. So then, uh, for that, uh, he sort of tries to sort of make his way with the dagger, you know, slowly but surely, stealthily, behind the Prophet uh, and sort of he's there within pouncing distance of the Prophet uh, and he's got this plan. He may not have shared it with anyone. He's got this plan in his mind. Just. As he's about to reach for the dagger, the Prophet turns around and looks at him in the face. And the Prophet says, are you Fadala? Obviously his mind is blown. He goes, yes, it is me. And the Prophet says, what were you thinking about doing? 
I know what you're doing. What you honestly, what do you think you're about to do? And Fala goes, no, 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 nothing. I'm just doing dhikr of Allah, doing my tawaf. And Fala says, he laughed, right? He knows this little boy, what he was up to. So he puts his hand on uh, Fudala's uh, chest and says, astaghfirullah, 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 right? Uh, and then Fudala, he then says, because you know, he's, you know, you know, there are some times in your life where you have that, you know, uh, heart stop moment where your heart sort of leaps out of your chest. And this would have been one of those moments where the, you're about to do something, the person you know, turns around, looks you in the face, puts his hand on your chest and says, Astaghfirullah. He knows the game is up. And Fadala then says, as soon as he placed his hand on my chest, there was no one more beloved to me in the world than the Prophet. And there and then he accepted Islam. You know, and so, you know, the Prophet Islam forgave him. There he is, one minute trying to kill the Prophet Islam, and the next minute, you know, just t- turns around. So again, shows the character of the Prophet Islam. So again, he becomes a good Muslim uh, 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 and true to his word after that. Uh, the next one to talk about, uh, and it might be uh, sort of the, the, the last major one we're going to talk about today, inshallah, is uh, Abdullah ibn al Zabri. Now, Abdullah ibn al Zabri, we haven't, I don't think we've mentioned him before directly, but he is the official propagandist. He is the, the, the chief uh, sort of uh, uh, media spokesperson for the Quraysh, right? He's the official poet, right? So he is the communications director and, and chief for the Quraysh. So he's the official poet. And we talked before how poetry was the main media and propaganda tool at the time, okay? Um, uh, so um, uh, he was the one who was in charge of coming up with the viral videos, the hashtags, the tweets, the... The, uh, the 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 YouTube videos, the, uh, the 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 films and the 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 hit songs, all wrapped up into one. This is Abdullah ibn al Zabri. He is the chief communication strategist for the Quraysh. Right, so he's the one who personally writes against the Islam, against the Muslims, against the Prophet So that's his job. He you know before Badr. After Badr, before Uhud, after Uhud. You know, this is his sole task as communications chief. He comes up with the strategy. The, the person who is countering him, the, the official chief communications officer for the Prophet ﷺ in the Islamic State, is Hassan bin Thabit. Um, and, and, and that's his gift. And we've talked about Hassan bin Thabit before. So these two, essentially, they... they 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 have face offs. They they have your uh, you know uh, your your um, uh, uh, viral battles against each other. He says he counters. He says he counters because that is the way to affect public opinion. That is the way to get your message out is through these poets. Uh, so it's critical that you get the right people in the right job uh, doing these tasks. So there's. Hassan on the t- on, on the side of the Muslims and the Islamic State, and you've got Abdullah ibn al Zabri on the side of the Quraysh, uh, the, the the idol worshippers uh, and people of uh, Mecca. So whenever, so um, you know, um, whenever uh, Abdullah would write something, the Prophet would turn to Hassan and says, "Go and respond." And we talked about there was one one occasion before, I don't know if it was at Uhud or after Uhud, where uh, the Prophet said to Hassan, uh, go and respond to what they're saying, and Jibril is with you, right? So uh, 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 Abdullah sort of, he uh, he feels uh, 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 depressed. You know, he doesn't know what to do. Uh, not just his job is gone. He knows that he was amongst the elite as part of that uh, fight against the, 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 the Muslims. So he decides there's no way he's going to be left alone in Mecca um, uh, because of his own guilt. So he decides to flee to Najran, uh, another sort of province or area in the peninsula, <clears throat> uh, because, like 
like we you know, talked about uh, so far, and they just don't want to be around the Muslims um, uh, because of their own uh, baggage. So he flees to Najran. And then Hassan ibn Thabit, he rightfully writes a long, stinging, scathing, you know, uh, uh, poem against uh, Ibn Zabri, attacking him in, 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 in very explicit terms and just getting at him and, and sort of in, in, in that, you know, uh, you know, sort of fit of hubris of victory, he has every right to that Hassan. They've won. Um, so he writes this sort of uh, propaganda piece against uh, Ibn Zabri, calling him a coward. He's fled, and it's you know, uh, it, it's a it's a superior piece of propaganda. And then obviously, as a, uh, uh, Ibn Zabri, he comes across this, and he feels even more depressed because he agrees with every sentiment in there. And he's a poet; he knows not just what's being said, but what's behind what's being said, right? So then he, you know, uh, those words really get to him like a, a stab in, 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 in the, the uh, uh, in the heart. So as, as he's sort of there in Najran, um, thinking about things, thinking about his life, thinking about his way forward, he decides there and then to convert to Islam. So then he starts to pack his belongings, make it known to his cousin who he fled with that he's, that's it, he's had enough, he's going back. And then his cousin says, look, what do you think you're doing? Where are you going? And he goes, look, I've dissect, decided to accept Islam. And then his cousin said, look, you know, we've come all the way here and now you're just going to leave me. I thought we were in this together. And he goes, nope, you know, why should I stay here in this strange foreign tribe? Why should I not go back to my own cousin, again, the Qureshi, to my own cousin, especially since he's the best of all mankind? So th this is genuine. He's had, this is not just, you know, it, it, it's not a superficial thing. Uh, so then he uh, decides to go back and then he, he gets to Makkah. He sees the Prophet ﷺ. Again, these are in the 19 days following it. He sees the Prophet ﷺ in front of the Kaaba. Uh, and uh, the, actually the Prophet ﷺ sees him first in the distance. You know, you know a bit like your you know, uh, your famous, you know, panning shots, Lawrence of Arabia, you know, somebody in a pinpoint distance, the Prophet sees him and says, this is uh, Ibn Zabri. And I see from him the nur of Iman. So the Prophet he's there in front of the Kaaba with his elite, with the, uh, the, the congregation, with the people around him. He sees uh, Ibn Zabri and everybody knows who he is. And he goes, I see from him the nur of Iman. As he comes closer, Ibn Zabri, he loudly proclaims, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. And he gives the shahada. And then he says, in his sort of eloquence, that a chief communications officer and propagandist would know, you know, all praise be to Allah who guided me to Islam. I was your enemy for so long, and I incited against you. I rode on horses and on camels, and I walked on the foot to oppose you. I even fled to Najran to avoid you. I'm just being honest, completely honest. You know, no, nothing to hide. But Allah uh, still wanted good for me. Despite my charge sheet, Allah still wanted good for me. And I've now come to you as a Muslim. And he's caused me to realize, Allah's caused me to realize how ignorant I was worshipping a stone that didn't even realize it was being worshipped. This is the folly of uh, polytheism, uh, of idolatry, right? I was worshipping a stone that didn't even realize it was being worshipped. All praise be to Allah who guided me to Islam. And the Prophet then she accepted that and gave him the glad tidings that basically, forget about the past. You become a Muslim, all your previous deeds are wiped away. All your sins are forgiven. And again, we've talked before about this, that, you know, when, you know, uh, that when you convert to Islam, all your bad deeds get conflipped into good deeds. I mean, how, how merciful is, is, is Allah in that, right? And then it's said that for the rest of his life, 
he obviously he's got this gift. Ibn al Zabri, he you know he 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 would become sort of an ally of Islam, and he would write pro-Islam poets uh, poems and propaganda. Again, this time coming from his heart, and he praised Islam, he praised the Prophet Sallam, right? Um, and uh, you know, and and the the, the Sahabi uh, later on generations they say that. He was a great poet and that uh, through that, all the evil that he did got cancelled away. So not, not just all the impact of his evil at the time, you know, all of that, he sort of, because of the genuine conversion, all of that got forgotten. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, within the next couple of years, the process on one occasion was so... Um, pleased with one of his poems, his propaganda, pro-Islamist poems, that he took off his own cloak, right, uh, that he was wearing, and put it around uh, uh, Ibn Azabri. And again, for a poet in the court of your uh, your masters, your chief, this is the, the highest accolade you can get, right? It's, it's, it, it's not... It's not money per se. It's not. It's not praise. It's when the commander in chief, the king, the, the 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 boss man, takes off his own coat or cloak and gives it to you. You know. So these poets, they they offer. They 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 live in a different realm, uh, and, and for them, this is the best that you know that that the, they can achieve and and and, the, and it's recorded process and did this on one occasion to Ibn Zabri and you know so uh, so that's that's what we uh, what we know and the process of wouldn't lightly it's not something that he does every week right he, he was so moved on this occasion that's what he did so uh, so we'll 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 finish there inshallah uh, and uh, uh, next week inshallah we'll talk about some of the other things the Prophet Sallam did in these 19 days, and of the two major things, uh, one is laying down the law, and the other thing is that he, he would dispatch platoons and battalions and, and uh, armies to destroy the idols and, and really subjugate any resistance around Makkah. And we'll talk about the, the uh, um, uh, demolishing of Al-Uzza, uh, Suwa and uh, another uh, 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 Manat, some other uh, idols uh, next time, inshallah. So until then, do remember the Ummah and Azim Yudwa, Jazakallah Khair, Bismillah Rahim, Walasa in Al Insan, and Lafi Kosa Illa Ladin Amun, Amun Swali Hati Watawaso, Bil Hak, Watawaso, Bisabar, Jazakallah Khair, Salam Dom.